Hello everyone. Uh, today we're going to look at The Necklace by Guy de Maupassant. I uh, apologize in advance for uh, the French. Uh, I do not speak French. Um, I will do my best for the names, um, but they will not be correct. So first, a little background on Maupassant. Uh, he's the son of minor nobility. Uh, the D indicates um, that he is of that class. Uh, his parents had an unhappy marriage. He was, when he was uh, young, he was a soldier in the Franco-Prussian War uh, and a government bureaucrat. And then he publishes Ball of, the, Ball of Flat, Tale of a Prostitute, and became famous. So he quit the government at that point. Um, early in his life, his mother risked social stigma by divorcing his father. Um, so you can tell that that's going to shape his, uh, um, his work. Uh, from a uh, psychoanalytic background, that should be something that we pay attention to. Uh, he's credited as one of the inventors of short story as genre. And he writes in a realist mode, focusing on not imposing moral judgment and with a main focus on class. Uh, so um, his work is very important for Marxist studies. A uh, little more on his background. He preferred solitude and meditation uh, as opposed to public life. He developed extreme fear and paranoia uh, later in his life from the uh, syphilis that he contracted as a youth. Um, and you can feel some of this uh, fear and paranoia in some of his works. Um, and so it's definitely you can feel the mental decline at different points. He tried to kill himself by slashing his throat, but survived. And so he was placed in an asylum. Uh, where he dies in 1893 and he wrote his own epitaph which I think uh, really gets at his uh, character in a way I have coveted everything and taken pleasure in nothing okay so uh, another dark figure that's not an upbeat happy uh, uh, figure to study but an important one for us to understand especially in the um, short story genre. <clears throat> so he's, um, he writes in the mode of literary realism. It's a part of the realist art movement, uh, which began uh, somewhere in Europe, right? Uh, French literature, uh, Russian literature, and extending into the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, in the U.S., it was most prominent in the first half of the 20th century. Literary realism, in contrast to idealism or uh, romanticism, attempts to represent familiar things as they are. Realist authors choose to depict everyday and banal activities um, and experiences instead of using romanticized or similarly stylized presentations. So <clears throat> the uh, period that um, periods before this were focused on the supernatural, the um, imagination, uh, escaping reality in many different ways or augmenting reality, um, often presenting figures as heroic and focusing on that heroic figure uh, rather than a more realistic portrayal of everyday life and showing people as they are. Um, so I want you to think of, as we're looking at this work, why realism uh, could be a very effective mode of writing uh, versus a more romantic view of, of literature. <clears throat> and a little more background here. Uh, Maupassant's mentor was Gustave Flaubert, author of Madame Bovary. They both believed that literature should reflect reality as much as possible. Um, Maupassant and Flaubert both believe that close observation and analysis of real life events could help us learn about the individual culture and the world. So 
interesting what I want you to think of here is with something like the Kugelmas episode, Woody Allen is is interacting with a realist author, but his short story isn't in the realist mode. And so there's another tension in Woody Allen's work uh, from earlier this session. <clears throat> also, uh, um, we didn't get a chance to watch the uh, video of Flaubert, uh, of uh, Madame Bovary, but um, um, in the if you go and, and were to ever see clips of that uh, movie, um, it is very much in the realist mode. It is very detailed, very focused on observation. Um, so... Maupassant also often used ironic elements in his work, which we've seen a lot this semester. Um, so I want you to think what some examples of irony were from the necklace. Um, and then we'll go through a few examples here, but there's, there's actually a lot more. The most obvious example is in the end of the story, uh, why the, my necklace was merely paste or fake. <clears throat> so it's the opposite of what you would expect. Um, the uh, Madame uh, Forestier is, uh, um, is wealthy, right? And so most people wouldn't think a wealthy person is going to have a fake necklace. But she did. Um, and that, sh that ironic element shaped the entire story. All Matilda wanted in life was beauty. And the work that she had to do to pay for the necklace robbed her of her beauty, right? So it's that quest that uh, um, this person's only focused on one thing, and that one thing robs her of that thing, <laughs> of the uh, element. So uh, uh, very ironic in that way, too. Uh, she's beautiful and charming woman who feels herself destined for all delicacies and luxuries, yet fate put her in the middle class without those luxuries, right? So <clears throat> it's a, um, a number of ironic elements in this story. And so I want you to think about why is irony an effective strategy for class criticism? How does it help us see uh, Marxist ideas in literature? Um, why might a writer use irony to point those out? A few other examples. Uh, when finally given her chance to mingle among those she envies, she feels inadequate in dress and appearance, right? So um, what she feels inside doesn't match what's on the outside, and we wouldn't expect her to feel that way. Therefore, it's ironic. Uh, the necklace was supposed to make her appear wealthy, but it made her literally poor. And that, uh, as mentioned before, even Madame Forestier is using fake jewelry to keep up appearances. Again, another ironic element. So what kind of messages are con conveyed through these examples of irony? So <clears throat> um, I think it's, uh, well, as we look into the story more, I think we'll see this more clearly. Um, but ideas like appearance is not always reality, um, longing for uh, to rise above your station can end up in disaster, which we've seen, um, or to uh, um, perhaps accept your station in life uh, rather than trying to uh, put all your your uh, um, efforts into attaining material wealth. Uh, focus on uh, more um, wealth of relationships and and ideas like that. So a few binary oppositions in the text. Uh, there, we'll see rich versus poor, generosity versus greed, and appearance and fa or fantasy or dream uh, versus reality. And so as we go through the text, I want you to think which sides of these binaries uh, are given uh, are um, given advantage. Right. So by looking at the text through the lens of those binaries and seeing which side is privileged, we can understand what the author was trying to um, convey or 
or what they didn't mean to convey, but do convey. Okay, so let's dig into the text. I'm going to ask you to bear with me a bit again um, as uh, I'll be jumping between my computer and my uh, notes. So there may be some hesitation or uh, brief moments for me to find the right place. Also, uh, um, well, let's, let's just dig in. So um, we're going to read through uh, most of the first page here and then we'll skip over some other parts. Uh, there should be, as, we're, as I'm reading through this, uh, a lot of uh, bells should be ringing in your head uh, for things we've talked about so far. Um, and so I'll try to point some of those out. She was one of those pretty and charming girls, born as if by accident of fate into a family of clerks, with no dowry, no prospects, no way of any kind of being met, understood, loved, and married by a man, both prosperous and famous, she was finally married to a minor clerk in the Ministry of Education. Okay, <clears throat> so what do you notice here? Uh, the first, first way that we're introduced uh, to the main character here is she's pretty and charming, right? So on one level you think, oh, those are very nice and wonderful things to say about a person, right? But the choice of what to describe is an emphasis that we should note, right? And sometimes authors might do this without thinking, sometimes they might do it purposefully, but it still helps us understand the text better. So instead of saying she was smart, she was intelligent, she was uh, widely read, she was um, incredibly talented in some way, we get pretty and charming, right? Um, so uh, from a feminist perspective, that is objectification. Uh, the, first, the first way the character is described is by objectifying her, right? Um, and then born by an accident of fate, so think, uh, um, think uh, uh, I am a cat, right? When the cat had no control over its life and it just was uh, an constantly um, faded or viewed life as if everything was faded. And uh, um, the idea of Shogun I, right, return to, that uh, uh, perhaps if the main character here was Japanese, uh, we wouldn't get the short story that we get here, right? Or at least, uh, i that's an overgeneralization. Not every Japanese person believes in Shogun Ai. Um, but if they had the Japanese philosophy, you know, perhaps this short story wouldn't have happened. There wouldn't be that tension. And it would probably be a boring story. So uh, um, then, so we get a mention of class also, which should ring uh, in our head that uh, Marxist, pay attention for Marxism. Um, uh, no dowry, right? So uh, um, again, objectification of woman, uh, the idea that this fee must be paid to, um, to get your property of wife, right? Of the wife. Um, but in this case, she's not even high enough class for that to be the sake. Um, so instead, she's married to a minor clerk, right? So the first way we're introduced to her husband, we're just given his profession, okay? So again, from a feminist perspective or a gender-based uh, lens, in this case, we see woman objectified, man is provider, is... Uh, um, um, defined by occupation, right? So uh, those are things we would pay attention to from a feminist perspective. So actually, let's let's just um, let's just okay. Well, we'll come back to that. So she dressed uh, dressed plainly because she could not afford fine clothes, 
but was um, unhappy as a woman who has come down in the world. For women have no family rank or social class. With them, beauty, grace, and charm take the place of birth and breeding. Uh, Their natural poise, their instinctive good taste, and their mental cleverness are the sole guiding principles which make daughters of the common people the equals of ladies in high society. Okay, so it's interesting here because, um, well, first of all, we get that she's unhappy with her class, with her social class. Um, But at first we're told, well, women have no rank. They have no social class. And you're like, oh, well, that could be a good thing, right? But then uh, instead we're told they should focus on beauty, grace, and charm, right? Um, And so they're not even uh, viewed highly enough to have an official rank or social class. And then uh, take the place of birth and breeding um, almost sounds like he's referring to horses or, or dogs, right? Um, so, uh, but the only way that they can overcome this uh, is through grace and poise and, and uh, um, social graces, right? She grieved incessantly, feeling that she had been born for all the little niceties and luxuries of living. She grieved over the shabbiness of her apartment, the dinginess of the walls, the worn out appearance of the chairs, the ugliness of the draperies. All these things which another woman of her class would not even have noticed gnawed at her and made her furious. The sight of the little Breton girl who did her humble housework roused in her disconsolate regrets and wild daydreams. Okay, so... Her class station drives her nuts. Um, And so um, it's a commentary on that. Also uh, watching her uh, maid, right, um, drives her nuts as well. Um, And so we get this idea she's not happy with her social class. Uh, If you were to read more of Madame Bovary, uh, that would be all throughout there as well. Um, and in some ways it's there for Kugamas as well, that he wants some grand romantic, um, life. Um, and I'm sure wealth is part of that. Um, so then she, uh, there's descriptions of what would make her happy. Uh, she would dream of and extend on through description there. Um, she would dream of again. So I'm not happy with my reality. I'm not happy with my class. I'm not happy with all this. So I dream of these great material, this great material wealth. Okay. Um, which so far, Kugumas, um, the necklace, Madame Bovary, um, there hasn't been, uh, this idea of dreaming to move beyond your class has not worked out so well for our characters. So we should pay attention to that. Also, something's been going on with how the main character is described here. And I'm hoping it's jumped out at you. Um, if not, we'll discuss it shortly. Um, try to pay attention for the next little bit um, and see if you can pick out the number one thing a feminist would take from this text up to this point. She had no evening clothes, no jewels, nothing, but those were the things she wanted. She felt she was the, that was the kind of life for her. She so much longed to please, be envied, be fascinating and sought after. She had a well-to-do friend, a classmate of convent school days who she would no longer go see, simply because she would feel so distressed on returning home, and she would weep for days on end from vexation, regret, despair, and anguish. Okay. So, um, then her husband comes home and says, uh, gives her an envelope, and it says, the Minister of Education and uh, Madame Georges Rampineau beg M and Madame Loisel 
to do them the honor of attending an evening reception at the ministerial mansion on Friday, January 18th. Okay, so at that point is where a feminist radar would just be going off kilter. <laughs> um, so for the first, almost the entire first two pages, uh, all we get is she was, she was, she dressed, she was, um, she grieved, she grieved, she would dream, she would dream, she had no evening, she wanted, she felt, she so much, she had, she would, right? So up until that point, she doesn't have a name. She's a nameless she, right? So a couple of things there. One, um, when authors do that, often uh, they want to universalize the character, get us all to identify with this character who, uh, um, in some way, right? Um, but from a feminist perspective, uh, what it what would often be interpreted as a number of things, but one is a woman of low social class isn't even worthy of a name, right? The first time she gets a name is when a wealthy person puts it in a letter, right? But then something happens. Instead of being delighted, she tosses it on the table. But my dear, I thought you'd be thrilled to death, right? Um, she gave him an irritated glance and burst out impatiently. So it returns to she. Why? Well, we're given an explanation over the next few paragraphs <clears throat> um, that basically she doesn't feel she's good enough, right? Uh, that she doesn't have the clothes, she doesn't have the accessories, um, so she's just going to stand out and it's going to be an awful experience. Um, so she, it returned to the um, generic she again, right? A woman of low social class is not viewed as uh, even worthy. Okay, so let's go to... Um, so she finally talks him into buying a dress uh, and he has to give up all his plans for buying a rifle and hunting. Um, but he says, OK, I'll make the sacrifice and I'll um, uh, give you the money. OK, so then even after this, she says, it's embarrassing to not have a jewel or a gem or nothing to wear on my dress. I look like a pauper. I'd almost rather not go to that party, right? So again, the only thing that matters is appearance, is material wealth, is uh, um, um, not who she is, but what she, who she's wearing or uh, what she's wearing. Okay, so um, we see this idea extended with, there's nothing more humiliating than to look so poor among a lot of rich women, okay? And if you try to extend this into modern society, we all know people like this. Perhaps some of us are or have been like this, right? I remember when I was in high school, um, all I wanted was Reebok pumps. Uh, I, I think they made a comeback at some point, so uh, young people still know what that is. <laughs> um, but that's all I wanted. I thought Reebok pumps were going to make me a better basketball player. I thought Reebok pumps were going to uh, uh, make all the women swoon and all the uh, boys envy me, right? Um, one problem. I didn't have money and I wasn't old enough to have a job yet. And uh, my parents uh, were also, you know, working class, but uh, struggling uh, working class. And so there was no way they were going to shelve out the uh, uh, $140 for those sneakers. And this is probably in the late 80s. So um, 
that $140 is a lot more than 140 now. So I remember just bugging and begging and, and doing anything I could to convince them to buy me those sneakers and just thinking that they were the answer to everything. Uh, and I'm sure most of you have some sort of experience like this. Um, but what's funny for me is eventually they did, right? They got it for me. Um, but I'll never forget years and years and years later, finding out how much my dad made each week uh, at work and finding out that those sneakers ate up a lot of that, you know, that he had to work endless hours to buy me those sneakers. Um, and so to this day, I, you know, I think about, um, yeah, I was thrilled about those sneakers for a few months, right? Um, but my, the sacrifice my dad had to make for those sneakers, uh, I still, you know, 20 something, 30 years later, I still think about. And so that's what's going on here. And so we can have kind of a reader response to this text and think about how that works in, in our society today. Okay, let's skip down a little bit. Let's see. Uh, oh, yes. Keep on looking. I don't know just what you'd like. Okay, so she's at <clears throat> Madame Forrester's, um, and she's uh, um, trying to pick out a necklace, and she chooses a diamond necklace, right? So you might want to think about why she might choose the diamond above all the rest, right? Um, and she has to borrow it. Why, of course. And she has this warm embrace uh, with her at this moment. So uh, keep that in mind, this warm embrace. So the day of the party arrives and she was a sensation. She was the prettiest one there, fashionable, gracious, smiling and wild with joy. All the men wanted her <laughs> and uh, wanted to know who she was, right? Uh, they wanted to dance with her. The powerful people took notice of her. She danced madly, wildly drunk with pleasure, right? Giving no thought about anything in the triumph of her beauty, the pride of her success, and a kind, happy cloud composed of all the adu adulation, of all the admiring glances, of all awakened longings, of a sense of complete victory that is so sweet to a woman's heart. Okay, so it just sounds magical. Again, if you uh, ever see Madame Bovary, if you look at the dance scene from it, uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, maybe I'll post it. Um, and uh, um, it's, a, it's just a Cinderella-type magical moment. And that's, that's what I want you to think of here, is uh, there's definite connection to the kind of idea of Cinderella. Um, and of course, that's a form of foreshadowing, right? Because we all know what happens to Cinderella, a, you know, uh, peasant girl who rises above her situa uh, situation. Um, so she leaves around four o'clock in the morning. Well, meanwhile, her husband had been dozing off since midnight, so uh, he's not as impressed. Right. And, and again, this, this idea is shown in uh, um, uh, Flaubert's uh, Madame Bovary as well. Um, matter of fact, it almost seems like they're copying from each other in some ways. Um, and so he threw over his shoulders the wraps he had brought for going home, modest garments of everyday life whose shabbiness clashed with the stylishness of her evening clothes. She felt this and longed to escape unseen by the other women who are draped in expensive furs. Okay, so it's a very much um, starting that Cinderella midnight uh, type moment. Let's see, so Louiselle held her back. Let's see, a little more on the Cinderella. Uh, they walked towards the sign, disconsolate and shivering. Finally, on the docks, they found one of those carriages that one sees in Paris only after nightfall, as if they were ashamed to show their drabness during the daylight hours. 
Okay, so much like the uh, uh, carriage turning into a pumpkin, right? Uh, of course, uh, um, that's from the Disney version. I'm not sure how much was changed in the Disney version. Uh, at one point I knew, I don't remember offhand. Um, so um, let's skip down a little bit. So finally, um, they l lose the necklace. Um, that evening, Loisel returned, pale, his face lined. Still, he had learned nothing. So they're trying to find it. They go to the police. Um, we'll have to write your friend, he said, to tell her you have broken the catch and are having it repaired. That will give us a little time to turn it around. And she wrote to his dictation. Now, this is an interesting uh, little scene here because it's the first point where he's saying I think you must lie to your friend right and this lie sets into motion a whole lot of stuff after it um, and it doesn't say oh you know she didn't push this lying she didn't she just wrote to his dictation right and so what it what it I think it kind of alludes to is kind of the classic scene of uh, from the Garden of Eden uh, where you have Adam, uh, or I'm sorry, Eve convincing Adam to eat the apple, right? But in here, you have uh, Adam convincing Eve, oh, you should uh, just lie. This will fix everything, right? Um, okay, so let's go on to the next. Um, okay, at the end of the week, they had given up all hope. Right, so a sense of hopelessness takes them over. And and here's an interesting little note, and we'll look at this a little, focus on this a little more after we go through the text. Um, Louisel, looking five years older, declared, we must take steps to replace that piece of jewelry. Looking five years older. So she literally ages because of losing that social status connected to that jewelry. <clears throat> it produces both despair and anxiety. Um, and finally, they start taking desperate measures. He went about raising the money, asking a thousand francs from one to 400 from another, a hundred here, 60 there. He signed notes, made ruinous deals, right? Um, did business with loan sharks. So that one little lie leads him to ruinous de deals, um, deals with uh, people who are not, um, not are shady, um, and ran the whole gamut of money lenders, right? Now at that, at that time, this was a clear um, um, slur, um, referring to Jewish people, right? Um, and the Jewish people in the temple. Um, and so um, we should take note of that, but uh, that was common in the anti-Semitic um, points of the time. Uh, he compromised the rest of his life, so he compromised everything who he is, risked his signature, so risked his character, right? Risked his reputation, Um without knowing if he could honor it and terrified by the outlook for his future by the blackness of despair uh, lost all prospect of all basic comforts of his life um, and he's tortured in body and spirit and he went on to buy the new necklace so again one little lie went to undermining his whole life right so I just want to share with you again, just a brief one, but I have kind of a reader response to this. Reader response is just uh, the ways that we interact with the text and how that teaches us about the text and about our culture and about the way we look at the world. Um, this makes me think about years ago, I owned a book business. I had over 30,000 books. I would ship out a hundred a day and, um, and I, I have a mind that's pretty good for business. And 
um, it just kind of comes naturally to me. So I was doing well at this for a long time. And what I noticed is here or there, all of a sudden, um, I start making little moral uh, bends, <laughs> you know, like all of a sudden, in order to compete, I knew if I just just bend, bend my morals a little bit, I could really compete well. Um, and all of a sudden, those little bends turned into bigger bends. And next thing you know, a whole bunch of little and big bends in your moral structure. Um, I hit a point where I was like, what am I doing? This isn't who I am, right? Um, but I also knew if I stopped doing that stuff, there was no way I could compete. And I'd go out of business and perhaps go bankrupt and whatever. And so I was kind of stuck in that trap, right? And, and that feels very much like the hopelessness that they're in right here. Um, and so what I, what I ended up doing was I said, I don't think I can be in business without compromising who I am. I, I just, I think the moral um, compromises I have to make just weren't good for me. And so I ended up just divesting and selling every book and not buying anymore. And, um, and turn to teaching. So that's why I'm here. But uh, I think for me, I connect to this text in that way. And you should always, when you're reading a text, think of how you connect to it like that. Um, okay, when uh, Madame Loisel took the necklace back, uh, Madame Forrester said to her frost frostily, right? Before is a warm embrace, now it's frosty. Uh, you should have brought it back sooner. I might have needed it, right? But she didn't even look at the necklace, right? So she just, it means nothing to her. She just casts it aside. So this thing that she sacrificed the next decade of her life for was not even looked at and just cast aside. Uh, so it's kind of a commentary on materialism at that same point, right? This idea that a material only has worth if society in general deems it worth something, right? So a, uh, uh, a lot of, um, so something like gold, right? The only reason gold isn't very useful in modern society as far as there's many other metals that are much, much more useful uh, than gold. But as a society, we've agreed to base parts of our economy on gold. So we've just as a society said, let's make this worth a lot, right? Um, but there's real no inherent value in gold. It's just something we've all agreed on. And so this is kind of a commentary on that kind of materialism. Uh, you know, same thing with things like fashion or clothing or just about anything that you collect. It's only worth what we agree it to be worth as a society. So like sneakers now, uh, the vast majority of sneakers sold now aren't as good for your feet as they were back in the 70s and 80s. Um, they're worse for your feet, right? Uh, they're made of much cheaper materials. Uh, they fall apart much quicker, uh, so they're not made as well. Um, yet... The same, uh, you could have got a much, much better shoe for the equivalent of what would be like $20 now, right? Now you're paying $200 for or $500 for because as a society, we said, this is, we're just going to make this worth more, right? Um, and so it shows the fleeting nature of material wealth uh, that it's it's all kind of an imaginary um, um structure, uh, an imaginary thing that we all agree to, uh, which is very platonic as well. Okay. So, um, Mademoiselle experienced the horrible life the needy live. She played her part, however, with sudden heroism. So finally, we get a, a sudden turn in her character. Up to this point, she seems very thankless, 
very not not a good person right in many ways all of a sudden when she has to live the life of the poor she's heroic uh that frightful debt had to be paid and she would pay it right so she dismisses her maid they get a cheap apartment they learn to do heavy work right she does everything for, that you can imagine that a, a, a poor person would do <clears throat> and does this for 10 years they both work like crazy for 10 years and finally he, everything including the exorbitant rates uh, were paid back <clears throat> so here's where we get the tension of the story um, towards the end, right? Um, this idea, if it was all Shogun I, we wouldn't, uh, be here right now, right? But we are, we're here. So Madame Loiselle appeared an old woman now. She became heavy, rough, harsh, like one of the poor. Her hair untended, her skirts askew, her hands red, her voice shrill. She even slopped water on her floors and scrubbed them herself. But sometimes, while her husband was at work, she would sit near the window and think of that long ago evening when at the dance she had been so beautiful and admired. Okay, so being poor impacts everything, including how she looks and how she acts. But she's still running from it. She's still having those daydreams, right? Uh, that escapism that allows her to accept this reality. But... Her physical appearance uh, has changed, right? Um, and this is still true, right, among the classes. Uh, if you um, hang out with people of different social classes, you'll often notice um, changes. My dad, for instance, worked every day of his life, and he's, his hands are uh, sw permanently swollen. He's missing the tip of his finger. You know, it's clear that he's worked. Um now, uh, um, what would have happened if she had not lost that necklace? Who knows? Who can say how strange and unpredictable life is, how little there, uh, there is between happiness and misery. Okay, another a commentary on fate. On fate. Um, and, and still to this point, she's not seeing um, what she'll see a little later that it's not just fate it's that after a fateful event happened the choices they made changed their fate um where if they had more of the shogunai attitude and just accepted the tragedy and went to madame forestier and and begged for mercy or whatever uh it would have turned out differently um let's see then one day she's out, she sees Madame Forrester uh, still looking young, beautiful, charming, you know, in the way that a person who hasn't been working on their hands and knees for 10 years can do, right? Uh, nowadays, something like can afford fancy clothing, can afford uh, plastic surgery, right? Comes along the same vein. So now class, her loss of social status has changed her so much that Madame Forestier doesn't even recognize her. It says, no. Nope. It, it's also a commentary on when you um, have a basic in-group, out-group mindset. Okay, this idea that people in my in-group I accept in many ways and people who are not in my in-group um, I don't accept. Um, we often see people in those outgroups as nameless, faceless, um, just stereotypical um, people from that group, right? Rather than individuals. And so here, she's just a nameless, faceless, uh, poor person. So she reminds her about who she really is. And then she says... Um, she tells them, tells her about her uh, uh, ten-year journey to pay for that necklace, and of course, Madame uh, Forestier stops and says, um, 
Oh, my poor Matilda. But mine was only paste, right? Fake. <laughs> Why at most it was worth only 500 francs. Okay, so that's a, like we mentioned before, an ironic ending. Uh, but I also think it hits on all those things we've talked about thus far about uh, how really at its heart, social class is imaginary. It's something we've made up as a society. Um, it's something that we participate in and buy into. And if all of us just said, no, this isn't the case. Uh, if tomorrow we all said gold and diamonds, not worth anything, right? They'd just be stones uh, or and metal. Um, but because we all buy into it, they're worth more. Okay, so we talked about the repetition of she and how uh, a woman of low social class um, doesn't even have a name. Um, so let's, let's look at a few other feminist readings of this text. So first of all, because women cannot work for success, uh, they are without class, right? Um, they must depend upon marriage to advance their social standing, as Madame Forestier did. Okay, so their only way to succeed in this culture was to um, marry or to self-objectify and buy into that system of which they give themselves as an object to uh, a husband uh, for and hope for social promotion. Uh, so self-objectification, -object women succeed only as fashion objects. A crucial symbol for feminist critics is the mirror in which Matilda admires himself, herself. And, at, and uh, numerous times throughout the text when she self-objectifies. Um, just to refresh some of the Marxism, uh, Marxist points, um, Actually, let's stick with feminism. We'll come back to Marxism. So feminist uh, criticism, just as a reminder, is concerned with the ways in which literature reinforce or undermine the economic, political, social, and psychological oppression of women. Um, and this doesn't mean, it doesn't, it's not saying how men are evil, right? It's how this, the system is set up in the unjust way, right? Um, you can have mostly good actors, uh, most men who are mostly good, who participate in uh, what we'll look at over here, patriarchy. A writer of a feminist analysis intends to closely examine how male and female roles manifest themselves in specific aspects of society through a text. Um, one way they do this is by looking specifically at patriarchy, uh, which is a system of society or government in which the father or eldest male is head of the family and descent traced through the male line, right? Um, it's important to note here, this isn't the system everywhere, right? There are uh, many cultures who the line goes through the matriarch or the woman. Um, there are, are societies where inheritance goes through the uh, women's line. Um, there's also... Uh, a long history of feminist societies, of matriarchal societies. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those societies, a lot of the history has been erased uh, by um, societies that came afterwards that were patriarchal and wanted to erase any evidence of them. And so a lot of, a lot of those societies are being recovered um, uh, through archaeology and sociology and um, um, anthropology trying to uh, um, recover those histories. Um, it's also a system of society or government in which men hold the power and women are largely excluded from it. Uh, questions that a feminist critic uh, would ask and what you should ask as you read a text like this. How is the relationship between men and women portrayed? How are gender roles acted out? What could this indicate? Do the characters take non-traditional gender roles? What does it reveal about patriarchy? And how would this be different if the character was of a different gender? 
And so I, that last one's the one that I lean on the most. Um, if Matilda was actually a man, um, how would this change? Right. And I think, I think, uh, um, that would be a good topic to explore in a paper. Um, so let's, oh, one last thing on feminism before we touch on Marxism and end for today. Um, so, um, there's also an idea of masculine and feminine symbolism. Okay. So symbol is anything, uh, an object person place that represents a bigger idea, right? So, um, dove is a symbol of peace. Um, the, uh, 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 Nazi symbol, uh, Nazi swastika is a symbol of evil. Um, and you get the picture. So, um, in this case, uh, masculine and feminine symbols, uh, really, uh, zoom in on, um, Freud, right? So Freud was obsessed with sex, as I've mentioned before. Um, and so psychoanalytic theory really relies heavily on the theories of Freud. And so part of psychoanalytic theory um, focuses on masculine and feminine uh, symbolism. And it's really formed through sexuality, right? Um, so anything that is womb-shaped or like... <laughs> um, uh, represents the feminine, right? Um, and anything that is more um, um, shaped like the male um, uh, anatomy <laughs> is masculine, is masculine, right? So a lock would be more feminine, while the key would be masculine, a bowl feminine, while a pen uh, masculine, uh, caves feminine, uh, sword, masculine, and so on, right? Um, and so what psychoanalytic theory would say is both purposefully and at the subconscious level, um, stories use this type of symbolism. And by studying that type of symbolism, we can understand both the conscious and subconscious workings of a text, right? Um, so we're not going to dig into this here. But it's just something to make note of that uh, feminist uh, and psychoanalytic, to some degree, uh, theory would look for symbolism like this in a text and try to understand what it means. So last thing is Marxism. Of course, this entire story is from a Marxist lens. It's all shaped and surrounding social class, right? So a few lessons you could get out of it from a Marxist point of view, um, or a few things to note that we've touched on a bit, but just to point out clearly, Matilda is born into a family of clerks, lacks a dowry, is unable to perform any service, and lacks any expectations. She is thus destined, okay, the fate again, uh, to remain in her low station. And so any attempt to exceed that fate uh, is going to end up in disaster. She possesses a strong imagination that prevents her from accepting her place. She fantasizes details about the upper class with a strong emphasis on material things. So again, just like Kugelmoss, just like uh, Madame Bovary, um, has a hard time accepting uh, their life as it is. Not only does class structure limit Monsieur Loisel's income, uh, but it also limits Matilda's perceived happiness. In contrast, Monsieur Loisel, along with um, uh, characters from uh, Cougamas and from uh, um, uh, Daphne from Cougamas uh, and from uh, uh, Madame Bovary and etc., um, it uh, uh, accepts his social place. Any regrets he holds are on behalf of his wife, whose misery affects his existence, right? So again, this idea that one um, spouse, if one spouse doesn't accept the social status, it can cause the downfall of both. Matilda's temporary shift to the upper class ends up being untenable and disastrous. 
right? Um, okay, so I think we've covered most of what I wanted to cover here. Um, the key is, is when you read a text like this, you should immediately be thinking uh, from a Marxist lens. You should immediately be thinking from a feminist lens, uh, psychoanalytic to a degree. Uh, you should be thinking of irony, right? Um, and, and that's what I want you to identify uh, in future texts. Okay, so go take the quiz on this and we'll be back soon.